In Year 12, when we were first introduced to complex numbers, we were promised that we would be shown how to differentiate a complex function. Now, one year later, we have been shown how to, and have developed this Maths Without a Mark Scheme project, in which we try to explain complex differentiation in a way that would make sense and accessible to others. We have probably had a little bit too much fun working on this. What is a complex number? Imaginary numbers were created for solving cubic and quartic equations in the 16th centuries, where mathematicians began to need to be able to find the square roots of negative numbers. Although described as impossible by Newton, they are extremely useful and have been widely accepted since the 1800s. A complex number is a number that has a real and an imaginary part. It can be written in the form z equals a plus bi, where a and b are real coefficients. So b is a real coefficient of an imaginary part. i denotes the standard imaginary unit where i equals the square root of minus 1, therefore i squared equals minus 1. The complex number z equals 2 plus 3i, the real part of z, we z, equals 2, and the imaginary part of z in z equals 3. This shows that z is the real coefficient of the imaginary part. This demonstrates how 3 is a real number, and as such, is the coefficient of the unitary imaginary unit. The complex number z equals a plus bi can be represented on an Argand diagram where the x-axis represents the real part of the number and the y-axis the imaginary part of the number. Unlike real numbers, complex numbers are two-dimensional and therefore form a plane in their own right. Understanding this is, a fun is fundamental for what is going to come. It is difficult to visualise the transformation a complex plane undergoes. Unlike a normal function, in which a real number is mapped to another real number, the function of a graph cannot be drawn like we would draw a parabola for x squared. Instead, the complex plane of numbers is distorted and stretched by the application of the function f of z. A complex function maps the whole complex plane to another complex plane, which becomes distorted or stretched by the application of the function. Differentiation of a complex function. Now we are going to attempt to differentiate a complex function from first principles to try and work out what rules govern complex differentiation and then to try and find out what the derivative of a complex function actually means. Differentiation from first principles. So before we can even look at dealing with a complex function, we need to really understand the fundamentals of how we differentiate a real function and then we can apply a similar method to a complex function. So if we take y equals f of x when f of x equals x cubed, then, then f dashed x equals dy by dx, which is just a combination of different weird notations. The gradient between two points of the curve, so we have x and x plus delta x, and we can approximate this gradient of the point at x as delta x tends to zero, the approximation of the gradient will tend to a real value of the gradient. So, by finding the gradient between the two points, x and x plus delta x, the gradient can be determined when delta x tends to zero. So, if f dashed x equals dy by dx, f dashed x equals the limit as delta x tends to zero, where you have all this rubbish which is on your slide. Okay, yeah. And then as we tend delta x, actually that last bit was just a complete load of pants, so I'll just carry on anyway. So we've got this rubbish as the limit as delta x tends to zero, we've got f and then in brackets x plus delta x minus f of x all over delta x. Substituting in for x cubed gives f, f dashed x in terms of x and delta x and you get all this rubbish, which all quite neatly and happily cancels out to x 3x cubed plus 3x delta x plus delta x squared. So as delta x tends to zero, we get f dashed x equals 3x squared plus naught plus naught, which means f dashed x is 3x cubed, which is what we all know and love already. Uh, the plane which is created to show the application of the complex function f of z uh, to the complex plane is a w plane. The complex numbers on the z plane are mapped by the function f of z to the w plane, uh, and the two axes are the u and the v axis, the real and imaginary axis respectively. So u equals v f of 
z and v equals m f of z. Now applying the principle of first of differentiation from first principles to the complex plane, the derivative of f of z naught can now be expressed as f of z naught as the limit of dz tends to zero of f of z naught plus delta x minus f of z naught all over delta x. But the important thing to remember here is that the limit of as d z z z tends to zero is not simple. It's, it's complex! complex. <laughs> <laughs> we now have a slight problem. Delta Z is a complex number, so it includes both a change in X, delta X, and a change in Y, delta Y. Therefore, it is possible for delta Z to reach zero in an infinitely many ways, as it is possible to approach F of Z zero for an infinitely many directions. The diagram shows how the addition of delta Z to Z zero causes there to be a change in both X and Y, both parts of the complex number. This is unlike differentiation with a normal number, where the y-axis is a function of the x-values, and is not a separate part of the number as with a complex function. We state that how delta z tends to zero is condition-free. It does not matter how it gets there, all that matters is that it does get there. The effect of this is that the complex conjugates are not differentiable. Am I carrying on? You can if you want to. OK. Um, so if z0 equals x plus yi, then delta z equals delta x plus delta, x, delta yi. For delta y to tend to 0, both of delta x and delta y must tend to 0. Therefore, the conditions for the limit may be redefined as both delta x must tend to 0 and delta y must tend to 0. So we can now express the derivative of f of z0 in terms of x and y. The derivative of f of z0 equals the limit as delta x tends to 0 and delta y tends to 0 of f of x0 plus delta x y0 plus delta y minus f of x0 y0 over delta x plus delta y i. The two composite conditions that combine to make the limit means that this calculation of the derivative gets very complicated. So we can now deal with the two limits separately in parallel, one part dealing with when delta x tends to zero and the other when delta y tends to zero. So the initial conditions for when delta x tends to zero is this equation in front of you. And by putting them in both terms of u and v, by splitting up all the different complex functions in terms of u and v, you get this equation. All the real parts and all the complex parts can then be collected to give you this equation. So now we can partially differentiate the above function which is given in terms of two variables. Partial differentiation deals with multivariable functions such as that above, which is usually investigated fully in the second year at university when you're studying maths. And of course, this part was absolutely amazing, <laughs> just to kind of yeah. say. <laughs> so partial differentiation. Basically, you do a backwards d6 thing, and you have backwards 6f over backwards 6x, if we're going to differentiate with respect to x. And then we treat the y parts as a constant. So if we have backwards 6f over backwards 6x equals 4xy squared. So now we can differentiate z with respect to y, treating x as a constant, to give us 4yx squared. And this technique can now be used to differentiate the function that was determined above which is in both terms of x and y. A return to complex differentiation. Now that we have obtained a derivative of f of z in real and imaginary parts, we can divide it into the two parts, real and imaginary u and v, as shown. Looking at these parts, it can be seen that the first is a partial differential of u with respect to x, and the second is a partial differential of v with respect to y, where the whole second partial derivative is imaginary. So we now have f dash of z in terms of two partial differentials, one real and the other